Good morning. This is Campbell McCreary from Amvest Capital here in New York City. Welcome to today's webinar, In for a Real Treat. We'll hear presentation from mem presentations from members of the British Columbia Regional Mining Alliance, the BCRMA. Uh, we'll hear presentations from Peter Robb, Assistant Deputy Minister at Ministry of Energy and Mines BC, Ascot Resources Limited, Dolly Varden Silver Corp, and Skeena Resources Limited. Um, a great big component of our webinars is Q&A, so please find your way to the question pane and send in your questions, uh, a specific or trying, golden triangle uh, specific. Uh, much, much welcome. Um, Avest is a New York-based specialist investment management and corporate finance firm based solely on the natural resource sector. Uh, very important, this call is for informational purposes only. Uh, or first, we're going to hear from Peter Robb, uh, the, uh, again, Assistant Deputy Minister at Ministry of Mines and Energy and Mines, uh, BC. So, uh, Peter, uh, if you want to turn on your webcam and uh, start the slides. Excellent. We have contact. See you in a few minutes. Thank, thank you very much, Campbell. Yeah, really, really thanks to everybody for coming today. I'd first like to acknowledge I'm coming to you from Victoria, British Columbia, the territory of Lekwungen speaking people. It is a beautiful day here in Victoria, and I'm really uh, thankful for being able to, to work and play uh, in their territory. Uh, I thought I'd start out by just telling you a little bit about um, the Golden Triangle and the BC Regional Mining Alliance and why we think this is such a great place to invest and, uh, you know, overall a good place to come in British Columbia. Um, really, you know, the success that we build here is because of the partnerships and the efforts we don't, we've all put in between Indigenous communities, uh, the investment community, uh, the companies and proponents, and um, ourselves, the government. And we're really proud of the work we've, we've put in. We've done a lot of learning over the last couple of years uh, to really try to unpack um, why it is people invest in British Columbia and why it is people didn't invest in British Columbia. We put a lot of work into engaging with all parts of these communities you see on the screen here to figure that out. Um, you know, I, I think that the BC Regional Mining Alliance really embodies what is key to um, attracting investment and bringing it here to British Columbia. It's uh, working with Indigenous communities, building long-term partnerships, and creating certain understanding on the land base uh, for investment and then future development. And we really have seen some of those positive outcomes with huge investments uh, in British Columbia from the majors over the last couple of years, um, but also investment, uh, a huge investment into exploration uh, across British Columbia. We've had a boom and especially in the Golden Triangle. Um, our current members of the BC Regional Mining Alliance, um, as was said in the beginning, are in the Niska Lisms government, um, the Association of Mineral Exploration, um, uh, Dolly Varden, Skeena Resources and Ascot Resources. And, and we're really proud of the work that they do. Um, you know, some of the pieces that we really want to talk to today. Next slide, please. Yeah, here we go. Uh, next slide. Uh, are about what what are we trying to achieve? And I think our overall goals that we have today are to strengthen um, the economic future and the opportunities um, in the Golden Triangle and across BC, and with and with through strong capacity development doing that. The second thing we'd like to really show is an, a model for how do you bring together multi-stakeholder um, groups and multi-stakeholder interests to build success. And we really think we've done a good job of that. And you'll hear from the companies of the relationships they're building today. Um, and for me, my, my job is to try to promote uh, mining in British Columbia and also open mines. And so long-term economic development is really what I'm here for. You know, I, I think I, we've developed some really good partnerships that have allowed me to get out across um, both Canada and the globe before the pandemic and talk about um, why not only the companies that we have as partners, but also British Columbia as a whole is a great place to invest. Um, and I think you'll hear from some of the proponents today about their projects, about the last two bullets you see, they're really about community sustainability and education and outreach. They really have built foundational relationships with the nations that the, whose territory they operate in and they really built relationships with the regulator and with myself to try to work out what that regulatory pathway looks like and define that in a clear uh, way, both for their investors, 
uh, and for themselves to get in and out of the regulatory process. You know, I, I think the key piece that I'll finish with is um, when I think of, I've been in this job as Assistant Deputy Minister for six, seven years now, but been in the Ministry of Energy and Mines for close to 20. And, and you know, for the last three years, I've had a three consecutive budget uplifts to really bring more staff into my ministry um, for a couple of reasons. One is to try to um, really bolster the staff I have um, for the regulatory environment, but also to bolster the staff I have for health and safety and community outreach and Indigenous engagement. Um, really, if you want to build a, build a mine in BC, I talk to the, my proponents all the time. If you want to build a mine in BC, you really got to understand water quality and you have to have strong Indigenous relationships. And those are the key pieces we spend a lot of time on. You know, I think another key piece is the infrastructure and opportunities we have uh, across BC, but especially the Golden Triangle. Significant investment in the Northwest Transmission Line, uh, major highways running right through the region, and strong relationships with our Indigenous partners. And those are really important pieces. And finally, I'd just like to say, um, you know, I, I think the last big opportunity you have in British Columbia is a really engaged uh, civil service and government um, to get out and have those conversations. And I think I've I've talked to the proponents a lot about, you know, we're absolutely, I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister. There is one um, sort of the second highest civil servant in British Columbia um, in relation to mining, um, where we really are interested in getting out and having those conversations with uh, small investors, but also the large investors to find out what it is we can do um, and how we can do it differently. I think if I look at uh, the recent investments in GT and, and the recent investments by Newcrest into the Red project up in that part of the province, you can really see that the efforts we're making here to make BC a tier one jurisdiction for investment are starting to work. We're seeing the majors really put a lot of money back into British Columbia and we're keen to continue that. So I'd just like to again say thank you for everybody taking the time today and I'll be around for questions and I look forward to the rest of the speeches. Great, thank you uh, very much, Peter. Uh, we're next gonna hear from Derek White, President and CEO, Ascot Resources. Uh, welcome to the show and uh, get your presentation up in one sec. Thank you, Campbell. Thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, <clears throat> we'll certainly try and walk you through in a, in a short time frame. Uh, the Ascot story and, and being part of the regional alliance and, and the Golden Triangle. Next slide, please. Um, just as an overview, uh, the Golden Triangle is an area located in northwest British Columbia and southeastern Alaska. Um, and, it, and really, uh, the border runs right on the edge of the triangle. Um, Ascot's located in the southern part of the Golden Triangle, uh, close to the mining town of Stewart, British Columbia and Hyder, Alaska. And um, this area has been endowed with um, significant mineral resources in gold, silver, copper, molly, zinc, lead. Um, and, you know, people have been building and operating mines here over the last hundred years. Currently, there's two operating mines, uh, one in the northeastern corner called the Red Chris Mine, which is a copper gold mine, and the Bruce Jack Gold Mine, Canada's largest underground uh, gold mine. Um, Ascot controls about 25,000 hectares in two properties, one called the Premier Property and the other Red Mountain, uh, very close to the town of Stewart, which benefits Ascot having that uh, infrastructure of the town, roads, water, power, et cetera, close to the mining deposits. There are four mining deposits, three located on Premier and one located on Red Mountain, which will ultimately fill a brownfield site uh, mill refurbishment, which is located at the Premier mine. The land in this area um, is under the jurisdiction and a long-term ownership of, of the Nishka Nation. And we have partnered with them in trying to bring this project back into production. Next slide. For Ascot in a snapshot, um, the new management has really been involved now, not that new, for the last three years. And over those three years, uh, really what the team was able to do was put together approximately 13 million tons of resources, 7.3 uh, measured and indicated resources, and 5.5 of inferred, and build a reserve out of that, um, which they could build a feasibility study around. 
And in April of 2018, the company released its feasibility study and then went on to project finance, um, both from equity and debt, the capital that's required to build the mine. And um, that process just completed. Um, and at the same time, the permit amendments, both with the support and input from NISCA First Nation and the regulators that Peter uh, talked about um, we're in the permit amendment application process, um, which we're hoping to complete shortly. We've ordered the sag mill and the ball mill. You can see the mill building behind me uh, to refurbish the mill. And we're continuing to work on a number of our exploration targets um, that can add additional resources into the future. Over the next 12 to 18 months, um, we will be uh, working on preparing the construction uh, preparation, getting it ready to receive the ball mill and the sag mill and start the construction, continuing our exploration to advance both near-term resources that we can convert into the mine plan and exploration targets that we can convert into the overall resource envelope. We hope to uh, finish our permit amendment process at the end of Q3 and then start in on the full construction and then ultimately production 12 months later. Next slide, please. In summary, um, you know, our feasibility study um, takes about 48% of our resources and puts them into a mine plan. The capital to refurbish the mine and establish the underground is approximately 176 million Canadian dollars. We ramp up ultimately to around 180,000 ounces a year. It's a low cash cost and has a pretty high IRR and NPV, both at spot and at current prices. So we see a fairly robust project uh, to get started, um, and, and that's really to get started. You know, we think there's a lot of opportunity to add a lot more value um, than the company has started with so far, but it's a good starting point, and we look forward to trying to bring this mine, being the, probably the third mine in the, in the Golden Triangle that'll be operating in the next short while. Next slide. The three value drivers that really add additional value to the company are number one, expiration. And like many of the proponents that you'll hear today, the exploration potential of the Golden Triangle is unprecedented. In our case, we have two kind of corridors, if you like, with a number of targets. And what you see in here, um, really in yellow, are the, are the areas where we have resources and ultimately underground infrastructure. And we have a number of opportunities uh, to, to explore, to advance those resources really over the next uh, 12 months. And we'll be starting to do that uh, actually next week, uh, going up and down these corridors, looking for additional opportunities. Next slide. The second really big value driver for us is we identified last year two areas, one west of an area called Big Missouri and the other one west of the Premier Mine, which have very high grade uh, opportunities that are not in our resource. But what's nice about these opportunities is they're very close to the underground infrastructure, meaning our development costs to bring them into the mine plan is much less. So there will be a focus, as in last year, to try and infill drill and allow these opportunities to come into the mine plan, which adds low cost incremental ounces to our production, either to um, add additional ounces each year or extend the mine life. And there's a real focus both from surface and for, um, from underground to um, drill these up, bring them into the mine plan and get the mining development that's required to, to add resources uh, to the mine. Next slide. I think the, the third real big value driver for us is on engineering itself. We have a, a, a pretty well experienced engineering team and really two areas of engineering that really help us drive the value. One are improving the underground mining method and we're um, examining and doing a lot of engineering work on a, on a method called the shallow angle mining system, um, which is a system which is being um, done by El Dorado right now in Quebec, which allows us to mine more flatly uh, uh, dipping deposits with much less dilution and lower development cost. And then really, um, although we can't change the way the mill building is, there's a number of optimizations we can make to either reduce operating costs or also improve recoveries. And we're working away on getting those things so that when we re-put the mill back together, you know, we'll have the best, best technology in, in kind of 2021 standards. Next slide. On the permitting process, um, you know, that does take partnership as Peter Robb commented, and it takes partnership between us and the First Nations. 
and it takes a partnership between us and the various regulators and ministries that are involved in in all the aspects of bringing a mine back into production. In Ascot's case, there were existing permits, but they were old and they needed to be amended. So in January of this year, we submitted our 10,000 page um, application for amendment and we've passed, uh, I guess, the first part of that, which is the screening. And we're working together with the support of the Nishka Nation and the regulators to bring the mine back into production as quickly as possible. And we're helped, you know, we're, we've been, you know, happy so far with the process and we hope to continue and and deliver on bringing the mine back into production but none of this really happens without the partnership and establishing relationship with the Nishka Nation and Ascot has been working with the Nishka Nation which is one of the few treaty nations in British Columbia um, to make sure that we cover their concerns and we make them partners into the project next slide just very quickly on on Ascot's sort of corporate um, perspective, from 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 an investor's perspective, um, we have rotated over the last three years some of the shareholders to more institutional shareholders, and so we have now a mix of retail and institutional shareholders. Um, we have uh, you know a sufficient cash right now um, and undrawn debt capacity that allows us to build the mine, and we just really finished doing that. Um, we've issued, you know, kind of most of the shares now that, that have required us to, to get ready for, for redoing the mine. And because we're close to infrastructure, and this is a brownfield site, in general, the cost of building this mine is much cheaper um, than if we were in a greenfield site doing it remotely. You can see a picture of the management team there who many of us have worked together in the past, and we have a lot of varied experience in mining, uh, processing, construction, et cetera, and, and our, our board of directors that is, is working to try and make sure that we bring the mine into production. Next slide. So just uh, wrapping up, you know, I think Ascot um, is hoping to be the next uh, mine that comes into production in the Golden Triangle. Um, we're certainly happy to be a member of the BCMRA and working on partnerships both with the regulators uh, and the First Nations. And, you know, all stakeholders have different, you know, things that are important to them, but Ultimately, we want to see the economic benefit that this mine can bring to the community of Stewart and Hyder and to their Golden Triangle as a whole. You know, a big thing for us is I think we're, we're fully funded in terms of the project funding. Um, we've got a lot of exploration potential to, to grow and improve the asset, both from a reserve conversion perspective, new discovery perspective, and engineering optimization perspective. We have a strong partnership with the First Nation. We've ordered the sag mill and ball mill and really getting ready to put this back into construction. And we hope that, um, you know, we can really make a difference for the Golden Triangle and the communities that we work with. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand over uh, to Sean. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have next Sean Kuhn Kuhn, who's the um, CEO, President and Director of Dolly Varden Silver Corp. Um, I see you and I see your slides. I think we're in good shape. Uh, tell us about Dolly Varden, Sean. Okay. Hey, um, thanks, Campbell. Uh, and thanks for that presentation, Derek. I uh, just want to start off by saying uh, I'm very grateful uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you to the BC government, thank you to Peter, and thank you to the Nishka Nation. Um, we've got a very special opportunity here at Dolly Varden. Um, we've, we're on a quest for 100 million ounces of high-grade silver in BC's Golden Triangle. Uh, we trade under symbol DV on the TSXV, and we also trade in the U.S. under symbol D-O-L-L-F. I will be making some uh, forward-looking statements throughout this presentation. Um, so I think the big theme here today is reawakening uh, giant precious metals mines in the Golden Triangle. Uh, with, with Premier, with Eskade Creek, uh, there's a common theme. These are, these are some of the highest grade, richest mines on the planet. Um, the, our differentiator here at Dolly Varden uh, for investors who are looking for a vehicle that's got leverage to a pure silver mine, uh, that's really what we're offering investors. Uh, so we have a modern resource in 2019. Uh, there is a 44 million ounce high grade resource that was published. And uh, the resource is built on, on the back of two high grade past producing mines. So in addition to the 44 million ounces that the project has today in a, in a resource estimate, there's been about 20 million ounces of high grade silver that is produced on site. Um, in terms of capital structure, 
Um, making this a, again a, an exceptional vehicle to um, to play rising silver prices. Uh, we've got just a handful of shareholders, uh, half a dozen shareholders that control about 85% of the stock in Dolly Varden. So these shareholders include about a 20% interest with Eric Sprott, uh, uh, Hecla Mining, just over 10%. And then again, there's uh, the well-known precious metals institutional investors that have some big meaty uh, share positions. Uh, management has skin in the game. Uh, through a series of large equity financings last year, uh, we enhanced our treasury and I'm happy to report we've got in excess of $20 million in the bank. So we're, we're armed to have a very, very aggressive drill campaign. Um, in terms of location, um, like Ascot, uh, we are in the southern part of the Golden Triangle. Uh, I've got that map on, on the right of the screen here. Um, and then I've zoomed in to that map on the left hand side of the screen here. So the Dolly Varden project is sandwiched in between uh, two endowments. So in addition to the 44 million ounces that are identified here in red, um, to the west of the property or on, on the left hand side of the screen, uh, Fury has the Homestake Ridge project, which is a million ounces of gold and 18 million ounces of silver. They had published a, a PEA last year. And so really what we have here is we have a regional opportunity. Uh, to the east of the property, Hecla, in addition to being an over 10% shareholder, um, has been exploring the Eliance trend where they've uh, published some high-grade silver endowment. So really, we've got a, a tremendous mining district, a, a region, and a tremendous uh, you know, M&A opportunities lie ahead. Uh, again, highlighting the tremendous infrastructure. Um, there are some parts of the Golden Triangle um, that, that lack infrastructure and where projects um, you know, have uh, difficult topography. Um, Dolly Varden is, uh, is unique in the sense that uh, we're located in the southern part of the Golden Triangle, uh, right, right near Alice Arm. We've got a road that goes from Alice Arm to our property. In addition to the road, uh, we've got multiple ways to access the property. We can drive to Kitsalt from Terrace or, or we, can, we can barge into Alice Arm. So there is, uh, there's access to power, a deep water seaport and, and a road network. And we've outlined our claims here in red. And in, in addition to the high grade silver mineralization on the Homestake Ridge trend, uh, we do also have a, a highly prospective uh, copper gold porphyry target uh, identified there as big bulk. And again, just, just like to reiterate here, uh, this is a vehicle to maximize leverage to rising silver prices. And unlike a lot of our peers in the silver space, uh, our project is in Canada. It's, it's in a very well-established mining jurisdiction. Uh, our project um, also separates us from the pact by its high-grade nature and its pure silver nature. A lot of our peers sub, uh, publish silver equivalents um, and their projects are predominantly zinc, lead. This is a pure silver play. It's a pure silver play managed by a group of um, management that's had a history of M&A transactions and a board that has uh, worked and governed at some of the uh, large silver entities, including Hecla, Coor, and, and gold companies like Anglo. Uh, we've got high institutional ownership, and, and most importantly, in terms of uh, catalysts and, and future uh, drivers of value, we've got a tremendous amount of exploration potential on the property. Um, these are uh, these are our directors, our advisors, and our management team. Um, and and the key here is they're a group of scientists that know the triangle. They know the nuances of the triangle, and uh, they've had a lot of success in this part of the world. Um, most of our ounces are uh, are at our Torbert mine, but we do have four deposits that make up the resource. And identified here in uh, in in black in black dots are all the different showings throughout this four and a half kilometer trend. So I, I would like to note that despite having um, 40 million ounces of silver in the ground and 20 million ounces produced, only 3% of the property has been explored. Uh, this is our resource. Um, there's a high degree of confidence in the resource. It's high grade. Um, the bulk of the ounces are in the indicated category and uh, the bulk of the ounces are at the Torbert mine. 
Um, in addition to the resource, we've done some metallurgical testing and the silver recoveries are in the high 80 percentile. Um, one of the features of the, of the deposit is it's a wide, um, it's a wide large ore body. So uh, we believe it's amenable to bulk mining methods, um, long hole stoping. Um, and, um, and in addition, there's a, you know, one of the key drivers here is the uh, low impact in terms of environmental footprint. This is an underground mine, it's high grade, and uh, it, it would, would lead to minim, minimal disturbance. Um, in addition to the, uh, the Torbert mine and, and some of the other mines that make up the resource, since 2017, there's been multiple discoveries um, along this silver trend. Um, you know, I'd like to highlight the, the chance discovery in 2019, uh, 25 meters of almost 400 grams of silver, including five meters of uh, a kilo and a half of silver. So there's, you know, despite this being an area that has seen exploration and production for the last 100 years, it is not uncommon for the company to uh, have a new discovery on, a, on an annual basis. So a lot of exploration upside. Um, looking at some of the success we had in the 2020 campaign, um, you know, my focus has been in expanding and extending the Torbert mine. And in addition to expanding and extending Torbert, as we've highlighted here, some exceptional drill intercepts, uh, both demonstrating um, big wide uh, zones, 30, 40 meter intercepts of uh, 300 to 400 gram silver. Um, but in addition to expanding and extending known resources, um, we're also focused on finding another Torbert on the property. And again, this is just showing um, some of the, the tools we use to vector in to these exploration targets. So uh, strong potassium alteration, uh, sodium depletion, these are some of the vectoring tools our exploration team uses to, uh, to target. And uh, again, this is uh, this depicts the the opportunity at Torbert. Um, the the deposit is open at depth. It's open along strike, um, and we will have a very robust drill program that will be starting uh, shortly. Um, and again, about uh, high level, we're we're looking at 50% uh, of that focus around uh, Torbert and around existing uh, resources, and then 50% going. Uh, up and up that uh, silver corridor looking for new discoveries. And again, Paramount with like, like Skeena, uh, like, like Ascot, um, you know, we've got strong relationships with our First Nations partners. A third of our workforce is from Nishka Nation, um, you know, and in, in addition to, you know, the working relationship, you know, we have built uh, friendships, um, you know, I consider uh, you know, people within the Nishka Nation, you know, I consider them, you know, very close friends. There are brothers, there are sisters, and, and without that strong partnership, we cannot move these companies forward. Um, and just, just recapping here, this is the, the purest high-grade opportunity for leveraging higher silver prices, leveraging our discovery team's potential to unlock um, the exploration potential of this property, and uh, there's tremendous m a opportunities uh, within the region and beyond um, so with that i'd like to uh, pass this off to walter thank you great thank you very much uh we have next walter coles jr uh ceo and director of skino resources limited um excellent we have contact how you doing walter great thanks gamble yeah see you in a bit okay uh, thanks everyone. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, go through our, our projects uh, with everybody on this uh, webinar. So uh, I'm the president and CEO, Walter Coles, as, as Campbell mentioned. Our flagship project is SK Creek. I'll show you where we are in the Golden Triangle. Uh, uh, we've got two, two projects. The smaller one is SNP. These are both past producing underground mines that we optioned from Barrick and have since acquired them 100%. Uh, we feel pretty fortunate to be operating in Taltan territory. Uh, they're great great partners, they understand mining, and uh, we're thrilled to be advancing these projects with their, with their support. Uh, other folks have mentioned on, these, uh, on the webinar today how important infrastructure is. We feel uh, pretty lucky between SNP and SK Creek, we've got three new hydroelectric facilities that were built over the last 
seven years at a cost of about $2 billion US. Um, when SNP and SK Creek operated originally in the 1990s and, and the 2000s, they were powered on diesel and propane. So it's a big change as we bring these projects back into production. We won't be using diesel and propane in any meaningful way. Instead, we'll be on cheap, clean hydroelectric power. So it's it's a big uh, a big paradigm shift on the cost side. I've, I've been told that you know back in the 2000s when SK was was operating, uh, energy costs were as high as 50% of the opex. Now we expect with uh, hydropower. Uh, energy costs will drop to around 5% of OPEX. So it's it's a tremendous uh, uh, difference in the cost structure that we can take advantage of. Just a little uh, recap on the history of SK. It operated from 1994 until 2008. It produced 3 million ounces of gold, 160 million ounces of silver. The gold equivalent grade was an astounding two and a half ounces per ton. Uh, that's the highest grade large mine I've ever heard of anywhere in the world. Uh, when SK operated, the price of gold and silver, they were much lower. Uh, we've mentioned energy costs were much higher, and it was also an underground mine. So the combination of those factors led to very high cutoff grades. In fact, when they started mining, they used a one ounce cutoff grade. And after they built the mill in 1998, the cutoff grade dropped to around 15 grams per ton. Our thesis in going after this asset was pretty simple. Three reasons, much higher gold prices today. Second reason is the lower energy cost structure. And then the third twist on this project was to look at it as an open pit where we thought we could drop the cutoff grade down to say a gram or 0.7 grams. And we had a theory there was probably a lot of gold left. That turned out to be accurate as you can see on this next slide here. Uh, this is the most recent mineral resource update that we published just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we grew the resource from 4 million ounces gold equivalent up to 5.6 million ounces. You know, of that 5, uh, I guess about 5.4 uh, million ounces is open pitable. Um, and that's what we're going to, that's what we're really focused on is the open pit ounces. Uh, the grade is phenomenal. Uh, it's about 4.2 grams per ton. In the, in the resource, uh, we're, we're working very hard towards uh, producing a pre-feasibility study, um, but this is just a, a phenomenal resource and we think we can keep growing it. Uh, the, the goal I've put to the exploration team is uh, next time we put out a, a resource update from, from SK, I'd like to see 7 million ounces of resource. So uh, it, it's an amazing project. It's like a gift that just keeps on giving. Everywhere we look, we see opportunities to uh, to add more ounces, so it's very exciting. Back in late 2019, we published a PEA. So just to recap on what those numbers look like, uh, at $1,500 gold, $20 silver, the after-tax NPV was around 900 million Canadian, after-tax IRR 65%, less than one year payback. Uh, this is based on that original 4 million ounce resource, as I mentioned, uh, we've since grown the size of that resource from four to 5.6 million ounces. So in the next uh, iteration of engineering studies, you're going you're gonna to see that reflected in the updated economics. Also, you see here on this page that the PEA had a production profile of about 300,000 ounces a year. That number is going to go up. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to grow that. Uh, the CapEx uh, in the PEA was about, it was about 300 million Canadian or 233 million U.S., uh, that number is going to increase as well. There's some, you know, I, I think everybody knows there's some inflation out there. And also we've increased the production profile of the project. So uh, that's also going to go up uh, when you see uh, the new pre-feasibility study come out. Okay, here's just a sort of a layout of what the mine will look like. Again, it, it's going to be open pit versus uh, historically with an underground mine. This allows us to go out and grab all that peripheral material at a much lower cutoff grade. There's some also uh, two huge advantages to this uh, or opportunities and advantages to this site. Uh, the first I'd mention is the former waste dump Albino Lake. Keep in mind the cutoff grade again back in the 90s was like 15 grams per ton. So anything below 15 grams ended up as waste in this lake. So we put a drill rig on, on Albino on the ice on Albino Lake and, and February and March, and I suspect we should have those drill results out 
uh, probably next week. So uh, stay tuned for that, should be exciting. Um, I mentioned advantages of a brownfield site. Well, the, the fully permitted tailing storage facility is a huge one. When you're permitting a project, uh, the tailings facility is usually the hardest thing to get permitted. Uh, SK has a huge advantage that we, we have an existing facility. Um, it's got ample capacity for the, the kind of project that we're gonna be bringing forward. So uh, a big advantage there. We've, we, we think we have lots of opportunity, as I mentioned, to, to grow the size of the resource. We're targeting areas that are close to the, to the mine. Uh, this 22 zone over here on the far right, we think there's probably a more rhyolite opportunities like the 22 zone where we can go out and find two or 300,000 ounces in little pockets. Uh, and they certainly add up. You know, I, I talked about growing it uh, from 5.6 million ounces to 700,000 ounces. I mean, to 5.6 to 7 million ounces. So that's a total of 1.4 million ounces to get to that target. Um, 22 zone has about 300,000, 350,000 ounces in it. So we find a couple more of those, that'll take us a long way towards achieving that goal. The other thing I, I do wanna highlight is that uh, we've expanded the mine down into this NEX zone, and it, it does look like it has a higher strip ratio. I mean, it's pretty obvious when you look at that, uh, but I just walk people through the math of, and how to think about that. At, at a grade of four grams per ton times, you know, based on the, the spot price of gold, it's about 60, $65 per gram in potential revenue. So if you got if we've got four grams in our ore, you know potential revenues is anywhere between 200 and 250 dollars a ton. That's revenue U.S. dollars. Our mining cost per ton of rock is three dollars and fifty cents Canadian. So you convert that into U.S. call it like 27 dollars U.S. Even if we are mining an area that has a 10 to one strip ratio, that's 27 dollars of mining cost versus 200 to 250 of potential revenue. So you can see that the high grade nature of this project easily allows us to tackle areas that have a high strip ratio. Uh, just highlight here, you know, some of the intercepts we've had down beneath uh, the pit. This is a VMS deposit, so it comes in stacked layers. I think there's a very high probability that there will be an underground component to this mine later in the mine life. It's a secondary priority for us right now because we just want to focus on finding more open pitable uh, mineralization, but there will come a time where we will be much more focused on the on the deeper layers. And uh, so just keep that in your head that this is a project that'll keep growing. Uh, based on the PEA, SK Creek would have a production profile of 300,000 ounces a year. Uh, that would make it the fifth biggest open pit mine in Canada. I suspect that over the next, uh, Next year, you're gonna see that production profile number end up somewhere between Meliodine and Detour Lake. Uh, so I suspect SK will be third biggest uh, gold mine in Canada uh, once we uh, have a little bit more time to grow the resource and, uh, and bring the engineering forward. I'd highlight that it's not just about size for SK, it's also about grade. You can see on this second chart here, the typical open pit grade globally is about a gram and a half, and there's the SK over there at 4.2 grams. So it's an incredible project because it's got size, it's got grade, and of course, you can't fail to mention it's in a politically stable jurisdiction, uh, which in this sort of crazy world today, that's that's more important than ever. Uh, SK Creek from a you know ESG perspective is phenomenal. Um, you know, I suspect SK will be one of the lowest, if not the lowest, greenhouse gas emitters of any open pit gold mine in the world. You can see on this chart here, sort of rankings, um, waiting for some of the pop-ups. There you go. So uh, a typical open pit mine averages uh, about three quarters of a ton of carbon dioxide equivalent per ounce of gold production. So again, three quarters of a ton of carbon dioxide per ounce of gold production. And then you look over there on the left, you can see SK Creek will produce 0.1 0.14 tons of carbon dioxide per ounce of gold equivalent production. So it's going to be a phenomenally green project. And there's there's two reasons for that. The, you know, the first one obviously is the connection to the those uh, those hydro uh, power stations. Uh, incredible uh, advantage that BC has with all the hydro power to make all of the mines at BC um, you know much greener than most other places in the world. 
The second thing is grade. And you, you'll even notice that, that you know, an underground mine is typically greener uh, in its greenhouse gas emissions per ounce of production than an open pit. But the reason SGA really shines is because of our super high grade, four grams uh, per ton. So we're pretty proud of this aspect of the project. Just looking at, at timelines here, um, uh, we've got a, a major exploration program kicking off here, 25,000 meters to try to keep growing SK Creek. We'll have the PFS uh, pre-feasibility study out probably in July. Uh, we'll continue with infill and exploration over the, over the summer and into the fall. And we're targeting to have the full SK Creek feasibility study done in the first quarter of next year and hopefully kicking off construction in the summer of 2022. So lots of exciting uh, milestones coming. Uh, last but not least, we've got to mention our uh, relationship with the Tultan First Nation. I was really honored that the Tultan decided to make a $5 million investment, equity investment into Skeena a couple weeks ago. I believe that's the first equity investment the Tultan have ever made in a mining company. So uh, we're, we're thrilled to be uh, partnered with them in, in, as uh, co-owners in SK Creek. Uh, the other thing I'd add that that we we did with the Taltan, I think is pretty innovative. We took a bunch of our um, uh, spectrum mineral claims and and we, in collaboration with the government, the Taltan and, and some NGOs, uh, turned it into a new nature conservancy. So uh, pretty exciting stuff to combine you know, the, the ideals of, of economic development with environmental stewardship, um, you know, something I think, uh, you know, it is, uh, is a core value of our company. And, and, uh, and I think the industry is coming around to this kind of thinking uh, in, a, in a pretty big way, especially in British Columbia. Last thing I'd mention here is just capital structure. We got a market cap of about 800 million. Uh, share price has done well over the last 12 months, but I think with the milestones ahead, we hope we'll have a continued strong share price improvement. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Walter. Um, let, I'm going to ask everyone, all the presenters, to rejoin uh, the show, and we'll uh, step into the Q&A. Vanessa, if you could put up that slide. Perfect. Perfect. Um, we're all here. Um, I'm going to dive in. Um, I can see the Nishkas are in a leadership role, but what is the status of relationships with other indigenous governments in leadership positions within the organization and partnerships? Uh, and also, can you say a little bit about how this particular group of partners came to be? Maybe that's for you, Peter? Yeah, sure. Um, good question. So how do they come to be? We, uh, what, what is it? The invitation is the best form of flattery. So we did see the uh, Yukon government with their Yukon Mining Alliance um, start to really attract back the majors about four or five years ago. And when I, as I said, I've been in this role for about a year and a half at that point, I thought, well, what is the one thing we can control? We can't control our geography. We can't control prices. We can't control a bunch of those things. But we can't control what our reputation is and what our engagement is, um, both nationally and internationally. And so we looked at that model and saw that they were actually getting the majors to come back into the Yukon. And so we, we did start to model it after that. And then one thing we did do differently was to reach out to our Indigenous communities up in the Northwest and really see if they had an interest in joining us in, in creating this alliance. And we were met with great success. And... And so, as I said, since then we've had uh, we've had the majors come back in, but we've also had the growth of these companies. And as you saw from everybody's presentation, the last couple of years have really been um, a huge success in what's happened on the ground, but also what's happening with our engagement globally. Uh, with respect to the other partners, really, it's a balance of getting too big too fast, and we we see expansion of the regional mining alliance, and we've talked a lot about it as a group and as our core members. We've kind of gone through this growth phase. Um, Tall Ten was a member, and we hope we'll be a member soon. Uh, in every um, relationship, there are bumps and bruises. A, a government and and the, and the Tall Ten really do have a strong foundational relationship, and I think you heard Walt talk today. Um, and we'll have another announcement between Taltan and government soon, I, I hope, on, on our, our long-term reconciliation goals with the Taltan nation. 
But I think you heard Walt say, you know, we in the last month, we've had a really big success with the Spectrum property and the Conservancy and the investment there. So um, Tal 10, I would say, is a very strong partner for mining companies up in that region. My encouragement would be in any engagement, get in early, get in often and have that conversation with the nations before you come have it with me. Um, you kind of know where, where what, what my um, goal is and you really should explain what your goal is to the nations and then come build it together with us. And I think Walt can probably speak to some of those experiences as well. And, and up in that area, we have some overlap with the Casca. And, you know, I think if you go talk to uh, the folks up at Silvertip, their biggest experience has been building that relationship with Casca and, and really designing where that goes in the future. And so I think these companies really exemplify for me, which is why I'm here, that willingness to put in the work um, with the nations because that's the success. It's water quality and indigenous relations. Those are the big things in British Columbia that we really ask these companies a lot about. Great. Thank you. And again, invite the larger listening audience to shoot in your questions. Just go to the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel and uh, if we have time to ask them. Um, curious to hear more details about the hydroelectricity the, with Skeena and SK. Uh, uh, where, what project is the hydro uh, sourced from? So maybe. We'll... So I guess what I would say is, is uh, British Columbia has a has a has an electrical grid, and that northern transmission line is part of that grid. It's connected into hydro power stations all over the province. So that that electricity is is shared. Um, by anyone who is connected into that grid. So yeah, Walt, I would say I would say all of our power is generated from hydroelectricity in British Columbia. We we don't have any other power sources really. It's either through major dams, as Walt talked about, or small independent power production like up in Walt's area. But at all, 95% of it feeds in a provincial grid. Um, and I know it goes across the states and some to Alberta, but yeah, all of our power is is from hydroelectric. We don't produce through coal fired or, or gas fired or any of those other or nuclear. We only have hydroelectricity here in British Columbia. Um, what is the general timeline to get a brownfields past producing mine in BC back into production, and also for let's uh, greenfields as well? Has this timeline for either improved recently? Can you give uh, any examples? Yeah, I, I can start. I, I think that all depends on your on your first question. If anyone question. wants to pipe in, uh, then that that's even better. So. It, it, it depends on the first piece. I said is, have you built the clear understanding of how you're going to deal with the big issues of water quality? That, that's probably the biggest thing is tailings management and water quality. Um, if you come with a not very fleshed out plan, it can take a while. I think you've, everyone's probably seen a seven years on some of the the major projects. Uh, on greenfield side of things. I think on the brownfield one, I think our most recent example of bringing a brownfield project in was in Bruce Jack and it was it was within a couple of years. And so it's really hard to draw that line of 60 years of exploration development um, process to when you enter the regulatory stream. Um, we, as I said, we brought on um, about 30 new staff in the last three years. Um, to address regulatory uh, concerns, and that's not just energy and mines. That's with the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry and the uh, Environmental Assessment Office. So, I would say we probably tightened up those timelines quite a bit. But we really, time really relies on a quality application. And the quality application, uh, I'll let the company speak to how they do. They have enough information to figure out what a quality application is. That'll be for them to judge. Great, thank you, Gabe. You have some burning questions go ahead <laughs> yeah just have a uh, two-part one for peter and then a question for each of the companies uh presenting today so thank you all for joining and taking the time uh so uh, just peter's just for those of us that don't know how is the bcrma uh structured and um and and, and how is it funded today is it, is it a non-profit and then how do you look at uh, development uh activities at, at bcrma so, so how is it funded? So we had a process called the Mining Jobs Task Force, which was brought together industry, academia, uh, the investment community, indigenous communities, um, and then both the exploration sector and the and the mine 
and the mining sector to get together and give us a recommendation. One of them was to start this. And so we funded a million dollars into this process. Government funded a million dollars into this process. And then each of the members play, pay a fee to be a part of it. So um, we are in year three. We're heading into year three of that uh, three-year investment cycle. Um, and so we'll have to decide whether government puts some more money in or we redesign our, our operating model. But right now it's primarily government funded. And then each of the participants pay for all their own uh, pieces and, and participation. We, and then a portion of that goes into, as, a, as we said in the beginning, training and development in our with our Indigenous partners. And in terms of membership in the organization, what, what is the benefit for, for future for other members? Really, it's about coming in and building those relationships with your Indigenous partners. And then I, we have a board with the Indigenous Nations and myself where we uh, bring on new partners. And uh, we're actually reviewing our terms of reference right now and, and are uh, with the proponents to redesign our board moving forward. And, and let me add something to that. You know, when, when Skeena first joined the BCRMA, I mean, the overreaching goal, is, as I understood it, was to help attract investment into uh, British Columbia. But the, you know, I would say equally as strong uh, a benefit that came out of it was just traveling to, you know, whether it was to London or to, or to Beaver Creek with uh, senior uh, uh, people from the leadership of the Taltan First Nation. And those, those trips together allowed us to build some very strong personal bonds that have, uh, have carried through now in all aspects of, of our project and, and sort of building that conversation and that, uh, uh, that engagement dialogue. So, um, you know, I, there are probably even more ways that the BCRMA has been helpful and, and beneficial, but, but for Skeena in particular, it was the Taltan relationship. Okay. I'd just, like, just like to add, Gabriel, um, I think, you know, for myself, there was this perception out in the market that um, BC was not as mining friendly as some of the other provinces, uh, Saskatchewan, Ontario, Quebec. And, um, you know, as somebody who's been working in the mineral industry for the last 17 years and only focused in Canada and having worked in Ontario, Quebec, uh, New Brunswick, Manitoba, um, my experience here in BC since 2018, it's, it is the number one jurisdiction in the country. And the fact that, you know, Peter's open to, to meet and to talk to investors and we have our, our Nishka Nation partners and that we as a group can collaborate and work together, it's a, just a tremendous advantage. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. I would just make one small comment as well. You know, we're probably newer to the to the area as a management team, and, and we have our own relationship, which you developed with the Nishka Nation, um, and, you know, in going through the permit amendment process. And I think that it's helpful having an organization like the BCMR RMA, you know, um, from the mining side more than the exploration side. You know, we have a BC Mining Association, but it's looking at coal and many different you know, aspects of mining. And this one is really focused on the area of the Golden Triangle and you know, the things that are important to those First Nations. So I think it's helpful to have a focused group because you can get lost in something that's a little more province wide. And I, you know, I'm kudos to the government for allowing a kind of a regional focus. I mean, the BCRMA isn't looking at things in Southern British Columbia, it's looking at things in the Golden Triangle. And so I think that helps both the proponents and the um, and the First Nations to feeling like they have something that's quite relevant to their uh, physicality and you know their location, etc. Good, thanks, Derek. Just there's one last question that's for for the companies. It's probably a hard one, but if you can answer as con as concisely as possible, you know why BC for each you know each one of you. Maybe you give me your top number one reason why you chose where you chose um, to you know develop your project and spend your time and 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 build your careers. Why why uh, like uh, why there over other parts of, of Canada? So maybe we could start with Derek and go across the board. Just you know your number one reason. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a complicated answer from my perspective. I'll try to be brief, but, you know, I've been working in the mining industry over 30 years and I've worked all over the world and I'm born and raised in Vancouver. And, you know, I, I think there's two reasons. Number one is because geologically this area is endowed with some of the best deposits in the world. And number two, I'm a proud British Columbian. And although I'm Canadian, I'd like to see more attention 
on this area. And I would really like to see more mines being built in British Columbia. And I've had a great experience working all over the world, but I'm proud to be from the West Coast. And I, I, I really have an interest in seeing British Columbia do well. Yeah, you know, and just to, to, to build on that, um, you know, I want to build it in my backyard. If I want to put my energy into uh, to my community and to to bring jobs to uh, to my community. So that's, you know, I've like like Derek, I've worked all over the country and, um, you know, watched uh, mining camps get built. And this is I'd like to see that in my backyard. Yeah. I, I mean, I'd re reiterate the obvious that the, the gold and copper deposits are in the golden triangle. Uh, but I'd also add that, you know, there are lots of there are other places in the world that are prolific in minerals. I think the difference is that there's a very supportive government in, in uh, British Columbia. So that if you find something and you're a good corporate citizen, you can see your project get built. Great. That's, that's excellent. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Gabe. Um, now we have uh, Adam Graff, our uh, senior analyst mining research. Uh, it's gonna have at you. Great, thanks, Campbell. Uh, I, I would just add to the uh, that last point about BC, uh, something that it has over uh, uh, some of its uh, nearby neighbors, uh, such as the Yukon. It has, which is also endowed with, uh, you know, much in the way of of historic uh, minerals and uh, and mines. Is that BC has has cheap power, and BC has infrastructure, and uh, those things you can't find uh, for the most part in the Yukon, where your power costs are typically you know 25 to 50 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, as well as uh, as well as as in Alaska. Um, but my question, I, I go, I'm going back to the the uh, the overall topic of uh, of native uh, native groups. And the the recent transaction where Newmont uh, came in and bought uh, GT Gold for 400 to some odd million, uh, mm -hmm. you know, here is a uh, an asset um, that has been uh, discovered and developed over the last four or five years, and yet only now uh, that there has been an acquisition that the Taltan seem to uh, be unhappy with the development of this asset, and I'm curious. Why is this only coming to light now that there's been a major acquisition? And uh, you know, doesn't that uh, cast uh, doubt in the uh, uh, in the minds of uh, international uh, investors looking to make acquisitions in uh, in BC? Yeah, I, I I don't know if I would fully agree that they're casting doubt. I think anytime you're going to build a major project in somebody's backyard, they have a few questions, and I think. Um, Tall Tan, like others, do have some questions about on one side of the valley, you have Red Chris, and on the other side of the valley, you have a potential for another massive project right there. And so I think that uh, Newmont has done a fantastic job of, say, of building that long-term relationship. It's not a race to build that project, and they have a, a great asset and a great partner in Tall Tan. And I think they've doubled down on their investment by uh, Galore Creek. They came in once and they came back into British Columbia again in a major way in that GT acquisition. So I, I don't know if I'd fully agree on the fact that they're sort of looking down on it. I do think they have lots of work to do that with their community about how do you put another project in uh, right across the valley from that one. And, and, New, and Newmont has been really good at saying, let's have that conversation about how would we build this project and how would we have those conversations? And I understand as recent as last week, the chiefs and, and the president of, of the companies were all of the company were meeting together and having these this dialogue. That's a good, healthy dialogue to have versus go away, we don't want you. Um, and that's not the conversation we have with Tall Ten in most of our cases. In, in any in any place, there are going to be some areas. And the Tall Ten are having those conversations, both with proponents and with us, about we need some area in our territory where we can get out and, and enjoy the landscape and enjoy um, uh, our traditional uses and practices. And, and as we've talked about, this is a very well endowed region of the province, um, and there is lots of exploration. So, you know, I, I think those are just conversations that we should be having and we are having, and we're really happy to have proponents like Newmont and the folks we have here today, we're gonna to put in the time and have those conversations. It's easy to flash a couple of big headlines, but 
that's why I get out and travel is to have the real conversations about what is happening on the ground. Um, so. Peter is is I, I'm assuming uh, your organization is active in trying to bring in both more native uh, indigenous groups uh, and uh, more uh, more companies that are both operating and exploring in BC and within the Golden Triangle because there are many. Absolutely, it's just that piece of getting too big too fast. You know, my primary goal is to make sure I have enough. Uh, bandwidth to permit and do all those things. My secondary goal is to get out and attract the investment. And so it's just that balance all the time. If this gets too big and takes up all of my time, I'm not spending as much time on the permitting and the day-to-day -day pieces. And so um, we're going through with COVID, we've lost a bit of the, the real benefit of what the BCRMA was, which was getting out, speaking face-to-face -face and sitting down across the globe, but you know, Beaver Creek and North America was a big focus as well. So we've taken a, a bit of a slower approach this year. And we're, as I said, we're redoing our, our, our board structure and our terms of reference for the RMA and how do we expand that? And that's that balance between industry, the nations and government of how do we keep this nimble? How do we keep companies coming in and coming out and, and continuing to grow the BC RMA? But it really is in its infancy of it, you know, we're in our third year now um, of trying to figure out how this works and, and how it doesn't work. And, I think we're making real progress. Great. Campbell, I'm not sure how much more time we have uh, on the schedule. I certainly have uh, individual questions for each of the companies that I can follow up with. Maybe one question for each company and then we'll wrap up, uh, to be fair. Okay. Uh, Great. First uh, question for for Derek. Um, what do you see as the challenges uh, at uh, at Ascot and and maybe specifically with with Red Mountain and uh, and maintaining the uh, that road up to Red Mountain? Yeah, you know, I I think um, the challenges for Ascot in the short term are to first get the permit amendment and get the mine built, and the real focus in the beginning will be around the Premier Mill, and and we have a lot of opportunity um, with that. Um, with the Nishka Nation and the regulators, we've divided the, the permitting process kind of in steps and um, the, the, the Red Mountain will come later in, in the process. I think the biggest challenge of the road is really the very last part of the road that goes up the mountain. And you have to remember, you get a lot of snow in this part of the world. And so um, one of the reasons we want to do that in steps is because we don't think necessarily taking a road up the side of the mountain at the very end is the right thing to do. And we are looking at uh, a conveyor type system. Um, that could be covered that really makes it safer and easier and more reliable and in the permit amendments when it gets to that stage down the road that's something that we're working with the first nation and the regulators eventually on on trying to bring in thank you derek quick question for sean uh given the given the current uh, silver price uh, i assume you you must be looking at your assets in in a new light uh, you know maybe maybe it's time to you know accelerate to production what's what's the strategy there yeah that's a that's a great question um so when i first came into dolly uh february 2020 uh we were in a silver price environment of around 17 dollars an ounce and you know looking at it high level and being really conservative um it was clear it was clear to me that you know we were this was an exploration story and it was about building ounces um, you know, in this new price environment, uh, high level, I think that there is a case to, to move the project forward in its current size. So the, the focus this season is half the budget is going to be uh, at advancing Torbert um, and, and de-risking it. And I think that the, the exciting part of, about that, and, and this has been demonstrated uh, really, really well at, at SK Creek, is you get surprised um, as you start to infill and as you start to move from, uh, you know, indicated to measured, um, you know, there is tremendous growth potential. So, you know, we're, we're going to be, uh, we're, we're going to, we are going to hit the project pretty hard, um, and uh, and so, and we are looking at it through uh, through a, through a production lens. So, in terms of uh, conceptual mine plans, um, you know, it's 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 more engineer focused um, this this season and um and the project looks pretty compelling but you know what i like to zoom out of just the dolly varden project and i like to look at some of the neighboring projects like homestake ridge 
um, and, and looking at is there a more thoughtful way for these projects to advance, um, you know, regionally. Um, you know, there's and and you know, despite metal prices, looking at them from uh, a, you know business combinations, I think they they work at much much lower prices if you're looking at combinations. Certainly, you have something uh, in mind like uh, a centralized mill facility, I imagine. Absolutely, and I think we're, you know, in in addition to uh, you know, in addition to multiple sites on our property, you know, one doesn't have to look beyond uh, uh, permitted sites that are very close in the area. So, um, so a lot of those hard yards have already been put in 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 the region. Excellent. And then Walter, quick question for you. Um, just thinking about uh, the waste dump and testing that material. Um, you know, is you guys are going to do a float? Uh, isn't there a good chance that the material in the waste dump has been superficially oxidized and it's going to present flotation issues? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I, I mean, the the work that we're doing right now is just is waste characterization, trying to identify you know what percentage of the waste rock would potentially be acid generating and and what percentage is not, and uh, we might take all of the uh, potentially acid generating waste rock and, and, and place it subaqueously as a way to, to manage that. Um, so that's on the, uh, the waste rock side. And, and again, on, on the flotation side, um, uh, things look pretty good. I mean, they look great on the silver side. Um, uh, we're working on the recoveries on the gold side, trying to get improvements in, in those, but uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's it's all coming coming together nicely. And and Walter, talking about your pre your your already permitted um, waste facilities, are, are you know if you continue to upsize the pit, are you going to run into waste uh, uh, capacity limitations? No, I, I think for the majority of the mine life, the the tailings facility is has ample capacity. Um, I mean, some of, some of the areas are, are pretty deep. Um, uh, right now, and 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 so there's lots of room in there. If we need more capacity, we can uh, uh, we could add uh, some berms on the on the sides of it to uh, increase that that capacity. So we feel pretty good about the situation. Okay, great, Campbell. I'll take I'll send it yeah. back to you in case there are any other additional questions from the audience. You no, know, I th I think I think we're in a good place. Want to thank everyone for tuning in. Please share your comments on your way out. You'll be queued uh, there and in a follow-up email. This recording will be available in about an hour. You'll get it in an email and um, also at amvestcapital.com slash replays. And uh, actually the original link will take you to the, um, the replay, which can be shared and uh, is encouraged to be posted, and et cetera. Thank you, Derek, Sean, Walter, Peter. Um, Adam for uh, today's program and um, encourage everyone to um, follow up individually with these uh, three great companies and um, thank you BCRMA as well. Uh, so with that um, everyone have a great rest of their day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.